Welcome back to Northwest City Politics in the Know with Juanita. We're glad to welcome you back to our show again this week. We're always happy for people like you, people that are interested in the issues that are happening in our cities. Because good government needs people that are involved, that are following what's are happening and sharing their thoughts and ideas with the mayors and city council people. So we're glad that you're with us again this week. If you haven't watched our show before, each week we'll have somebody on from one of the nine cities in CCX's viewing area to tell us what are the current areas, aspects, problems that that city council is dealing with. And then we encourage you to, if it's your city, take down the person's phone number and email and be in contact with them if any of the issues resonate with you. But from time to time, we'll go to other groups that affect all of our cities, and that's what we're doing tonight. We decided that it, we can't wait any longer to learn about what happened from the legislature and pass it along to you, even though things are still a little bit in flux on some areas. So we're very happy tonight to welcome Representative Michael Nelson from 40A to share his thoughts and ideas on the past legislative session and help those of you out there learn a little bit more about it. Now, you've been on our show, but not for a while, but I'm gonna let you introduce yourself out to our wider audience. Tell them a little bit about yourself and your time in this district. Good evening, I'm Representative Michael Nelson. I represent, as she said, 40A, which basically is 80, uh, Brooklyn Park, south of 85th and west of Xerxes. Although I do now have um, E3, Precinct E3, which is east of, east of Xerxes. Ah. But uh, anyway, I've been in this legislature. I've been first elected to the Minnesota House in 2002. Uh -huh. So I've been serving, serving since January of 2003. So I've been, this is my eighth term on, in my 15th year in the legislature. Um, before that, I was a carpenter. I worked both in the private sector, private sector and in the public sector. Uh, I also was a business agent before I got elected for the Minneapolis, for the uh, Carpenters Union. And uh, like I said, that's who I am. Uh -huh. Well, we're very happy to have you with us tonight. And we always want the people out there to know, well, what happened in the legislature and touch base on, we can't touch base on every issue, mm -hmm. but we've talked a little bit of ahead of time and picked out some issues to go on. Now let's switch and talk about the budget for 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm which we alluded to already. But setting the budget was kind of a contentious process because you get the Senate, the House, and the governor. Mm -hmm. And all three of these groups have to come to some agreement on it. What were some of the major points of difference that you noticed along the way? Well, this year, because for the first time in a lot of years, we had a Republican House and a Republican Senate with a Democratic governor. Right. And the Democratic governor and the Democratic minority in the House and the Senate have different ideas right. on where money should be spent, policies that should be in there, all those things. That, and so there was some tension there and the, the Republicans having the majority in both the House and the Senate, they were trying to push forth their ideas of how things wanted to be, they wanted things done. And the governor pushed back on that and the first round of budget bills that were brought forward, he vetoed them because there was a lot of policy items in the bills ah, that he right, didn't agree right. with. And he has the final say because the, the, the legislature can pass them, but they have to, they have to get them. He has to, to veto. He, he has, has to sign them right. before they become law. So their job's not done until they come to an agreed upon right. um, with the governor. Now, a few years back when Tim Pawlenty was governor, we had a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, and we worked, learned that we worked with him and ended up when we ended up having a bunch of all of our budget bills got vetoed that year also right. but then we came back and worked with the governor and his staff and came up with stuff that so get allowed us to get things we mm -hmm. wanted in there that the governor didn't like but also allowed the governor to have things in there that he didn't he wanted and we came to a mutual understanding and we ended up getting a bill a budget passed right and that's kind of what they tried to do this year um and it, there was some bumps along the way in the last week of session when a lot of times this stuff, just, oh, like, the, right, just like the kid right. with the high school kid or the college kid <laughs> that's got a paper due, you wait till the right. last minute to get it done. Right. And some of that is because of the negotiations going on. But we also had another, I guess, fly thro thrown in that ointment that the Republicans had a one seat majority. And if right. any one of their members was missing, they couldn't pass bills. Right. And what happened was 
one senator's father, uh, Carla Nelson from Rochester, no relation to me, but Carla Nelson's father was sick and then ended up passing away. And so she was missing oh, the sure. last couple of weeks of session. So they didn't have enough votes to pass anything. Ah. And so that created some of a, a log jam at the end. Plus there was things that they were insisting on that <clears throat> the governor wouldn't insist, didn't want. And so there were those negotiations right. going on that when they finally got passed, we ended up running out of time with enough time to pass all the bills. Yeah, because then different, in the past, some of the special session things have been proposed but not happened or take yeah. a long time to put together. Maybe you can talk about how they resolved that re veto. Well, and this, and the, they, the bills we ended up sending a second, they sent up the House and the Senate sent uh -huh. a second rung, a rung of bills that was negotiated with the governor's staff. And, but they didn't get them done by the May, right. uh, the, the May adjournment date. Now there was agreement that, okay, we're gonna get these bills, we're really close, right. we can do this in a one day session. And we ended up having a week special session. The governor called us back in right away the right. next day. We came in, we didn't have bills to pass, the language wasn't there, they didn't have the bills forward. The one of the biggest bills, which is one of our larger, other than education, is one of our larger section of our budget is the Health and Human Services oh, Bill. Right. We didn't have language in that till, I think I believe it was Thursday ah. of that week, so we couldn't even pass it out of committee without oh, right. without language and right. knowing what's in the bill. So that was part of the problem this year. Um, again, and then the, and the governor, as he went through and passed them, agreed he, agreed he, he, agreed he was gonna sign them if there weren't certain things in them, but right. a lot of stuff got put in them and he didn't wanna veto the bills as a ah. whole. So he, he, he signed the bills, but he line item vetoes some of the spending items in there, right. one of them being the state legislature's funding. Right, right. And uh, hoping that that'll force them back in to negotiate and fix some of the things that he disagrees on. Yeah, so it's, it's ongoing, It's right? ongoing, it's still in limbo. Right, right. Now, do you have any thoughts or ideas on how this process might be improved? And, and I know that it's a whole, it's, the group as a whole has to, but I thought it'd be interesting. We have, we've to done share some of that. Thing, we've done some of that things in the past. We've, uh, you know, there are complaints a lot of times is you don't get to read the bills before you sit, vote on them. Uh -huh. So we've had, there's been proposals that we've tried to propose in the rules that a bill has to be on our desk for 24 hours before we vote on it so that we know we can read it and know what's in it before we're voting on it. Right. We ran into problems with that last session with the bonding bill where it got, that was passed that we had 45 minutes before the end of session, the bonding bill was dropped on our desk. There was a lot of mistakes in it, uh, including a mistake that wouldn't have allowed them to spend any of the money anyway. Yeah. Um, so um, that's, that created log jam, and then we ended up not passing that bill because of it. Right. Um, the governor actually never got to the governor's desk. So, I mean, there's, there was some of that stuff that's been proposed that didn't happen. They set, we have what we call deadlines that we set. Right. The deadlines that a bill has to be through its first policy committee by a certain date, otherwise it's dead for this session. Uh -huh. Then it has to be through a, a finance committee if it's a finance bill before, the, before a second deadline, otherwise it's dead. We have these deadlines. So we moved those sure. deadlines up earlier this year, hoping uh -huh. that it would give us more time to negotiate right. between the governor and the conference committees. And it didn't, it didn't help. Um, there's been talk uh, Senator, excuse me, Representative Pulowski, who's a social studies teacher um, from, from down in Winona, had, had proposals of different things that could be done to make the session the process better. Uh -huh. But in a lot of ways it boils down to is both sides not fighting with each other to right. the very end and actually sitting down and trying to come to some agreements and negotiate and realize that compromise is not a bad word. Right. But compromise has been a bad word the last few years. And the, and, the, and the Democrats are afraid if we agree too much with the Republicans, we're gonna have someone to the left of us run against us in a primary and, oh, and right, kick us out. Right. The, Demo or the Republicans are feel the same way that if they agree too much with the Democrats and don't hold a hard line, that they're gonna get someone from their right that's gonna run against them. And so that's, it's, there's this concern that's there. And, and so that's at times, it puts us in like little foxholes and all we're doing is lobbing grenades at each other right, and right. Not, uh, not, not really actually getting anything accomplished. 
Do you think there was any benefit to having the special session right away versus <clears throat> jockeying back and forth about it? In the past, turn this off. In the past, um, we've, when they've had special sessions, one time we got called back in right away, but usually there's a couple days yeah, holding out period. Right. And you let the committees that are working on them, the governor, the speaker of the house, the majority leader of the Senate, negotiate these things and get the bills and get the bills in language form so we can read them, know what's in them. Right. And then we come back in and pass them. And that was what they thought that we were gonna be able to do by coming back right. the next day. Right. Um, it ended up not happening. Um, I don't know, like I said, it's, <laughs> it's uh, some of that stuff, It's we could do a better job. And it's part of the nature of the times, because it's not just at the no. state level, it's at the federal level too, so. We've, uh, we've, we've ra this last few years has been a hyper-partisan yeah. ship age, and it's, and it's, it's, it's it makes it more difficult to, to actually work together. Right. Because uh, because of both sides of the legislature, there are good people there wanting to get oh, good yeah. things done. Oh, yeah, right. It, and that whole process of bringing different ideas to some common thing that people can agree with is not easy. It's not easy, no, no. Not easy at all. Now, we'll switch over and talk a little bit about the budget surplus okay. because uh, Minnesota has had one. The, there was a considerable amount and there were major differences of opinion on how it should be used. What did the amount end up to be? And maybe you could talk about what it is and how you need to really look at other factors. Well, originally the budget surplus, I believe, was $1.25 billion okay. surplus, right. which was there was money left over after what, two years ago we projected, this is what we were gonna spend, this is right. what the tax bill was gonna bring in. And so we set our budgets accordingly. Right. And at the end of the, this biennium, if nothing had changed, and it would, be June, would have been June 30th, right. we were projected, again, projected is right. the key word right. there, That's to I have $1.25 billion left over. Um, because we, you know, when we set our budget, we look ahead and we say, okay, starting June, July 1st of 2017, this is the budget we're working on right. that we passed this year. Going forward, this is what we're going to spend. And that's based on what we think we're going to bring in with revenue, what we think the need is going to be, how to balance those out, how to divide those up, and look ahead two years. Well, right, right. any one of us knows, if we look at our household budgets, I can project two years ahead, this is what's going to happen. And as soon as I do that, um, car breaks down. Right. You have to get the car fixed or get a new car. Get a flat tire and I got to replace all the tires. I wasn't planning on that. Right. The refrigerator right. breaks down. Right. My mother used to always say that every time there were five paychecks in a week, month, and they thought they were going to get ahead, <laughs> something, something would happen. <laughs> Kids would need a new, right. new set of shoes, and, and that there blows that fifth paycheck. Right. So that's kind of how we our, our budgeting process were. We're budgeting ahead two years, and we're making educated guesses based on a lot of a lot of information that we get. But again, it's still a guess. And sometimes, like this, at this last time, we figured this how much right. it was going to be. At the end, we'd have, we'd be balanced at the, we, we would, at the end of uh, June, June 30th, 2017. But it, more money came in. The economy recovered a little bit better than we thought. More revenue came in. Some of the programs right. cost right. less. We did less spend, less spending. So we ended up with this 1.25 um, billion dollar surplus, which is far better than all the. But they been part of the 10 years before right. that when we had deficits right. all the time. Um, the differences of opinion on how that should be spent. Um, the Republican majorities wanted to give a big tax breaks to property tax breaks to, to businesses. Um, some of them businesses that don't even, people don't even live in Minnesota. Ah. Like the, the Mall of America would have got a huge tax ah. break. And that's owned by the Gramazian brothers in right. Canada. So right. they would have got benefit of that huge tax break, not residents of Minnesota. The, res the Democrats we and the governor wanted to do some t targeted tax breaks, but we wanted to put some of that money back into the reserves because a couple things going on is one was the health care crisis, the stuff that's going on with the Affordable Care Act, whether it's going to be here or not be here, and whether oh, it's right, gonna, there's going to be right. more, we were going to lose money as a state, which all the proposals that have been out there, the state's going to lose money. The governor wanted to set some money aside to so that if that came in, uh, to fruition that we would have money to cover that while we dealt with it. Um, we ended up spending it the first of the year because of some of the stuff with the Affordable Care Act. 
that we ended up giving money to large insurance companies oh, right, to right. help them stabilize the insurance uh -huh. market, the individual health care insurance market, and give have them give 25% rebates to the people that had to buy through the health care oh, right, right. through the exchange. So some of that money was spent, ended up being spent there. Um, but the governor wanted to put some of that money aside because of the uncertainties, number one. The other thing is, we've been on an eight-year re uh, recovery since the last recession. Right. And the economists that, that uh, talked to us at the state keep telling us, we're closer to the next recession right, than right. we are to the last recovery. Yeah. And we need to start looking out and making sure that there's enough money that if we do get in a recession and what happens in a recession, tax revenues go right. down because right. our biggest source of income of the state is income tax and sales tax. And when the economy goes bad, sales tax revenues drop, personal people in incomes right. drop, and so we get less money coming in and we need to have a, a cushion there to get uh -huh. over that. Plus the stuff com coming in, like I said, with the federal the Affordable Care Act, whether they repeal it, what they do to replace uh, it, all right. that stuff that we have no control over. And it looks like that the governor was right in that, but the, re the Republicans in the Minnesota House and Senate didn't see it that way. And they had they had different ideas, how to spend right. it, how much to spend in different areas, where to cut. So it's, it's uh, that was part of the, the tension that went on so, through the whole so, session. So ultimately <clears throat> what happened with that? Well, oh, another thing, another factor too, is that the budgeting doesn't take into account inflation, right? The, Maybe you could just speak to that a little bit. A few years back, before I was in the legislature, right. they put in a thing because they don't, the, again, this is Republicans put this in, programs that say, well, we're spending this much, and a low, you know, gallon of gas today is a dollar, uh, it's two dollars something now. Right. We project it's going to go up, so we're going to build in inflation that we're going to still need to buy so much gas to right. fuel the vehicles for the state. So we're going to put it in for inflation in there. Well, the Republicans a few years back said, "No, we're not going to recognize inflation um, in spending. We're going to start out with ba the base budget, what you spent last year, and go forward from that. And then the new budget, and if we don't give you any more money, you're going to have to come up with cuts to save money right. to." next year because we're not going to count inflation. The funny thing is on the revenue side, right, right. they count inflation yeah. on the revenue side that wages are going to go up, people are, more people are going to be working, yada, yada, right. yada. So we're going to bring more money in because of that. So there, it's kind of disingenuous right. that we right. count it on the revenue, but we don't count it on the spending side. And so that can create some goofiness at the at the end and, and at the end of the budget year, why you end up with a big deficit or a big surplus. Mm -hmm. So in a, in not in specific ways, but in <coughs> a general way, then what happened with the surplus at the end of the legislature and all the other bills? At the end of the legislature, some of the money came out of the general fund and went to went into transportation bill uh -huh. to put some more money in transportation, right. um, which is uh, something we haven't done a lot of in the past. Uh, some of it went into uh, tax breaks, into the tax bill, where uh -huh. there were tax breaks for businesses and that, that was toned down some from what the original proposal was. Some of that went into tax breaks for individuals and, and, and more towards the middle class, middle uh -huh. working air people that, again, the governor helped bring that right. about. And some of it went into, like I said, they went to the health care thing and then, and like I said, some of it went back, they did put some of it into the reserve so uh, that we have money there going forward. But those are the two big things. Right. So they did get, they did get a, a large tax break, not as large as they wanted. Um, and they, and like I said, they, and some of it went in the, into the roads. Instead of uh, in, in the past with our roads, we funded those with the gas tax that's constitutionally dedicated to roads and bridges. Right. And it's divided up by a formula to the state, to the counties, to the cities, and to the, low, to the townships out there they, the roads are divided out and they all get a piece of that right. gas tax money. And they they put money in from the general fund, which we have money today to do that, but ah. next by in we may have a deficit. Right. Right. And that money won't be there. And that money could go back into the general fund and now you leave the roads, repairing our roads, short of money. So it's, it's, I, was, I had concerns about that. Oh, right, right. Then another... Uh -huh big change that's been in the works for many, many years is Sunday liquor laws. Because uh, maybe you can give the history of this issue a little bit. Well, some of the, some of the Sunday laws, and they go back actually prior to uh, um, 
prohibition. Uh -huh. But there was what they call blue laws on the books. And right now, the only blue law that's really left is you can't buy a car on a Sunday. Right, right. Um, but before the Sunday liquor was one that you couldn't buy liquor on Sunday. It's, you know, if you look at why there are convenience stores and why 7-Elevens and all them broke, started building up is because grocery stores used to not be able to be open on Sunday. Right. And so if you needed milk, the convenience store was there, you could buy milk and basic yeah. essentials were there. They were allowed to be open, but then those were picked, gotten rid of. That was one of the, another blue that was let go a long time ago. Uh -huh. Right before this session, the only two laws that I'm aware of that we had in Minnesota were Sunday liquor sales and buying buying cars on right. Sundays. And uh, a lot of the big box stores wanted to, buy this, to open up on Sundays. There were people that saying, oh, "I live in a border city. They're driving over to Wisconsin. They're driving into North Dakota to buy liquor. Why shouldn't we be getting that revenue to the state of Minnesota?" Uh -huh. So that was part of the argument. A lot of the smaller mom and pop they were they were called liquor stores did not want to have Sunday sales because uh -huh. they weren't seeing, I mean, that's their argument is that we're not going to sell any more liquor. We're going to sell the same amount of liquor whether we're open six days or seven days. It's just going to spread it out over uh -huh. seven days. And if I'm a small shop and I got to have open, it means I got additional um, employee expenses. I got to oh, have employees right. on there. My lights are going to be on. I got heating and cooling got to be running. Um, all that stuff has got to be going and therefore it's going to have a cost. And I'm not going to get any more sales. So it's actually going to hurt me. Municipal stores. Brooklyn Center has a municipal gap, um, liquor store, uh -huh. and they they didn't want to begin for that same reason. There's right. additional cost without a lot of additional sales. Yeah. Is what their argument was. We'll see how that works out. Um, it got passed. There was enough. There was enough people that switched their allegiance, including the speaker. In the past, has been an opponent of uh -huh. Sunday liquor sales, and this year he decided that, okay. I, I'll change my vote. I agree, and that's part of the reason was the push behind to get in why it got passed. As the Speaker of the House was able to had changed his mind uh -huh. and swayed enough people to change their minds. Oh uh -huh. yeah, leadership makes a difference, and, uh, right? And so now we have Sunday liquor sales, uh -huh. and I don't I haven't bought anything on Sunday myself. Yet, but <laughs> no, then I'm not a big drinker, that's right. so it's uh, we'll see. Well, now this was that an issue during all the time you've been. It's I, I think, think it's, it's I think, I think it's, it's been I think it's been discussed ever since yeah. I've been in the legislature that. Um, Sunday liquor sales, people wanting or pushing for it. Um, I've been, on, I've always fallen down on the side of the municip municipal liquor stores uh -huh. and the small mom and pops, and I've voted against it in the past, and I voted against it this time, but it's law now, so right. we'll see how it, how see it how works it out. And, right. and maybe they're all wrong, and maybe everyone will have a huge, larger sales and, and more income to the state. We'll, right. we'll see. But it was one of the big issues. It was one of the big issues, the big issues on, yes. right. Now let's move into the area of, of government operations and elections. And usually these tend to be bipartisan issues. Can you talk about the history of that? Well, the election piece of it is government operations is not so much, but the elections piece of it, the elections going back, and I think even before, I think going back to Perpich right. and before, there's been an agreement with the governors that they will not sign an election bill unless there's strong bipartisan uh -huh. support. And so the Republicans can't stick something in, the Democrats don't like, and the Democrats can't stick something right, in, right. the Republicans don't like, and ram it through when you have a governor of your oh, party. Right, so, right. And, that's, and, and the, all governors, I said going back to Perpich, I believe, and uh -huh. before, have, have basically held the, held the, the legislature to this right. thing. If you're going to pass an election bill, it's going to be something that both sides agree on. Right. Um, they're... So there, a lot of times they're very mild, bland bills. A lot of times they're cleanups and stuff. Um, I think this year the one thing I'm most proudest about in the in the elections bill, I, mean, I serve as the on the election on the government operations right. and elections right. committee. I'm the Democratic lead on that committee. Is that we passed and it got put into the budget and got signed into GALA, setting up a fund for counties to replace and renew their election equipment. Um, if everyone remembers back to the Gore Bush election right, and, right. The and the hanging chads in Florida uh -huh. and all the issues that we had around the country with outdated election equipment that that really affected the presidential election, but it affects all our local elections also. That a lot of states, counties around the state had obsolete election oh, equipment right, that right. And, and and it created problems in the election. So there was after that election. The, the Congress, the U.S. Congress, passed the Help America Vote Act, uh -huh. HAVA is a lot of times what it's called. Right. And what that was, it was, it was allowed um, 
had set up a fund and gave grants out to states and gave grants out to, you know, that went down to the counties to be able to buy the equipment. Right. And that and what most people don't understand is everybody, every county owns that election equipment. Right. It's not state equipment. No. It's not federal equipment. It's owned by the county, and they're responsible for conducting the elections. They're responsible for making sure it works, all the stuff, making sure the right things are on the ballot that are supposed right. to be there. And Help America Vote Act was passed, I don't want to just say that was after the 2000 election. Right. So it was passed 20 year, 15, 20 years yeah. ago. And, some, and so a lot of this equipment that was bought back then, and a lot of, we, we really brought our, our uh, election equipment up to date oh, in the last right. 15 years. Right. But a lot of that equipment is wearing out, and it's getting past ah. the end of its useful life. And so it's having to be replaced. Um, some of our bigger counties have used some of the last remaining HAVA dollars they had to buy tallying equipment for the, the absentee ballot voting right. that we have right. that has gone through the roof, the number of people voting, uh -huh. so that they've had bought big tabulated machines to do that. And they've used their money and their county money to do that. And some of the bigger counties can afford to do that. Some of the smaller counties, like the Renville counties, the Swift counties, Coochiquin County uh -huh. in northern Minnesota, and go around the state. There's a lot of small counties that can't afford to do oh, that. Right, right. And so what this, what we did and we set up as a fund so that we're not paying for all of it. Uh -huh. They have to come up with most of the money, but we're going to give them some money. They can tap into this fund to buy equipment and keep their equipment up to date so that one of the most important things that we have that we do as a, as a state and a, a county government is hold elections. Oh, right. And we want right. to make sure those elections right. are counted. I mean, all we got to do is all the stuff going on with the Russian hacking, oh, right. a different thing. A lot. Even we want more. to make sure we, it's even more. We want to make right. sure we have secure, a uh, secure system that that people can count on, so they know when they vote that their vote's going to get counted, and they can trust the results, so that they know that the people that get elected, it even if. It's Donald Trump, who I personally didn't vote for, but he's our president, um, or a person that's their, their local city council person, right. the local the, the person that's the governor of the state. Even though it's something somebody you may not agree with, that you know that they won fair and square. Right, right. And we want to make sure that's the important one of the important things we do. And I think that's why I'm proudest of the fact that we were able to get that passed uh -huh. and money funding for it, so that going forward, that we have a way that we can keep our equipment up to date and make sure that. We don't have these problems. We don't want to have another episode of hanging chads and no. all that fun <laughs> stuff that goes on, and, and make sure that we're, there's security there for our for our votes and for our our our, lux, our election equipment. Right. Yes. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise in helping our audience out there get some ideas of the things that happen mm -hmm. in the legislature and and kind of a look behind mm -hmm. instead of just what you see in the newspaper. We're glad that you've been with us and come back again. Bye.